Yeah. Is that yeah. one of yours behind you? That's Kirsty's photo. This this is kind of her study. I'm I'm privileged to be in her study to uh, to record this. <laughs> and she's also a photographer. Yes. Well, she's all sorts, but she's a, she's a photographer. She's a videographer. She's a researcher. She's doing a PhD at the minute. So yeah, she's um yeah a woman of many talents. Yeah, and tech support because she was right on it then. Like right, Garage Band. What should we well, do? She, so I'll she, send you the file. Exactly. So she has been. I, I don't want to actually move this microphone. I'll move it a little bit just so you can see it. Look at this thing. Oh wow! Yeah, there we go. So that so she's got to do a bunch of PhD interviews, and she needs obviously good sound quality. So she's just been setting this microphone studio thing up for a while. So I'm lucky enough to be able to use it for this. Yeah, anyway. sounds good. And uh, and you've just been for a skate, you were saying? Yep, just down the local multi-story car park. Very very glamorous. Nice. How's that? Yeah, good. We've got a few of us that go every sort of Tuesday and Thursday night and uh, we bring sort of various ledges and kickers and flat bars and things down and um, pretend that we can still skateboard. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my sort of skating these days as well. Everyone like fighting around, kind of, yeah. Manuals. Did you see there was, um, there was a, you may obviously remember Radlands, remember the BBC logo that Radlands had from years ago? There was yep. a guy who kind of, Saw that, and copied it, and made a made a little sticker thing called Dadlands. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's like, um, do you, obviously you no know horsley, but do you know Mike? Is it as well? They've got their groans brigade yes. yeah, yeah. thing. I know Mike. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Mike, I think he's going to send me some stickers, maybe. But yeah, I like it, man. It's cool. Hmm. Fresh is off. How, Mid- you know, once you, once you get to this age, it's great. Midlife, like midlife um, skateboard companies. There's uh, definitely a pr- proliferation of those now with all of us getting to uh, our 40s and 50s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. So um, you were saying when we were chatting, because obviously we've had a bit of back and forth before doing this. So you, you've you got a day job as well, right? Is that yes. is that the case? As, mm-hmm. See, obviously we'll talk about your photography, but you're also... So what's the day job? My day job is uh, working for a skateboard distribution called Rock Solid. And we, I do, I just do sales. I'm lucky enough to do them from my kitchen table. <laughs> so nice. I just, uh, yeah, I just, I just on the phone most of the day. Um, Rock Solid itself is based up in Bristol. We've got a warehouse there. And we bring in a bunch of skateboard brands like Magenta, Butter Goods, Isle, um, Hotel Blue. I mean, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's about 40 different brands that we do. So I could go on about right. that. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to be able to just get up out of bed and go and sit at the table and do my job. So. Yeah. And have you always balanced it like that then? Have you always kind of had a few things going on at once? I mean, not, not years ago. I, I mean, when I was working for Sidewalk, that was full time. So, you know, yeah. I'd go out and shoot photos sometimes seven days a week. I mean, I try and only do, if it was like a normal week, I try and only do like four or five, but problem is you end up because you love skateboarding, you just end up going and doing it. You know, someone will ring you up and say, Oh, I know it's your day off, but do you want to come and shoot this? And you just end up doing it. So yeah. See, so you- so you were you were like yeah you were at it so but then when because so sidewalk you were photo editor right and that was that when it was like you were you were in abingdon you were based there um, so sidewalk was based in abingdon but i when i was photo editor I, I lived in various places i lived in manchester for a bit i lived yeah. in um near cheltenham in the cotswolds for a bit i spent most of my time in bristol though i think i, I think one of the reasons of moving to the cotswolds was i wasn't in bristol because if i had been I literally would have been just consumed by skateboarding 24 seven. So it was good to kind of to leave the city and go out to the countryside and try and not think about it sometimes. Right. Give yourself a bit of distance. Aye. Right. What? So you, that was something you were aware of? Um, yeah. I mean, we lived, I mean, we lived in Manchester for about, I don't know, about six or seven years. And then we did a, a, a myself and Kirsty did a round the world trip. And we kind of took a few nice. countries in and, you know, obviously did a bit of skating, did a bit of photography. When we came back, I was like quite conscious that I was going to come back and work the sidewalk again. So I was like, right, we need to live somewhere where I'm not kind of immersed in it. Because in Manchester, it was like, it's one of the, you know, sort of biggest skate scenes in the country, which was brilliant at the time. But, you know, we were sort of a bit younger, obviously didn't have kids then. And, yeah. um, you know, you could kind of do a bit more. But like when uh, Little Miss was born, Little Balin, you can see behind us on the wall, she's 10 now. Yeah. It was like right, you you know, we, you need family time, so you need to be able to get away from it because I I know what I'm like, I just I'm just a skate ran. <laughs> if I could do it all the time, I do it all the time. So, right, yeah. So you were like, okay, let's give it a bit of separation. Yep. Um, 
because you'd so and how long were you at sidewalk because i think because i used to do i mean if you weren't at abingdon i think i so i worked at permanent from like 96 to like 2005 maybe so i can't believe we've never met that seems quite random really it's so, I, I, so, so we would have a meeting um at the office I don't know, like maybe once a month, something like that. And I would drive down from a lot. Of, I think when we used to have the meetings in Abingdon, because I'm trying to think it moved to factory in 2006, right? Yeah, that was just before I left. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I lived in Manchester till 2003. And then I would have driven from the Cotswolds to have meetings at the office. So, I mean, yeah, I just I can't believe our paths never crossed because I'm sure yeah, it seems, seems pretty you, random that. Yeah, you were maybe I mean, there in the day and I would turn up like later on in the day and then we'd have meetings into the evening. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I think we did because I was ever based in Abingdon because you must, assuming you met Ed Lee and you probably yeah, of course. met, yeah, yeah, you met yeah. like, and obviously I'm assuming you know Ed Blumfield pretty well. Um, Hill. We, did, we, we, we didn't go yeah, for a yeah, bike ride in, this lunchtime. <laughs> he's in Toro, <laughs> isn't did. he? Fuck. Yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, he's I in surf, Toro. I surf with him all the time. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I keep forgetting he's down there. So, yeah, it's but I was, I was always based, so we were always doing winters away or I was in Brighton and same thing, really. Like we would go to, um, go to Abingdon for like planning meetings, but not that regularly, like every couple of months or whatever. Yeah. So, right. So you, so you did that. And so did you follow, um, sidewalk to factory then? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to think how it went. So yeah, I, 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 did follow it to factory and I worked there until 2010. But again, I think I went to the factory office a total of about three times in five years that I left. So, right. you know, I, I tried to go there as little as possible. And, you know, my job was being on the road anyway. So it was, yeah, you know, it was always like that. Yeah. You had the best, the best of it. Oh, there's my phone telling me I need, need to go to bed. Um, <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah. Keeping you up. No, no, no. It's funny. Isn't it? Like I've, I d I've just really noticed recently that, um, I get these alerts and tell me I need to turn my headphones down and I get these, I get these alerts on my phone telling me that I need to like go to bed and shit. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> fucking hell. Wow. All right. Bit, uh, bit mumsy. Um, right. So you, cause if I'm, so I've obviously been doing a little bit of, you know, know, know a little bit of your, your story and been chatting to some of our mutual friends, like chatted to Wig a little bit, um, chatted to, yeah, chatted to a few people and, and obviously, like, um, it, and Neil, I know a little bit as well because he listens to the podcast. Who you did the Milton Keynes book with, right? Neil Bowen, um, yeah. Yeah, and and like, so I, obviously, you're back. You start. You're from Milton Keynes, is that right? And you kind of you grew up on the, in the Milton Keynes scene, right? I grew up in Milton Keynes. Yeah, I was born in London, but um, my parents moved to just outside of Milton Keynes when I was three. So yeah, kind of grew grew up at my formative years in Milton Keynes. Yeah. And that was your way into skateboarding, was it? I think so. Yeah, just I mean, I I you know got my first skateboard and skated in the in the village in rural Northamptonshire where I lived. But it was it wasn't long before we kind of you know Milton Keynes was maybe a twenty minute drive. So you know, well when we were younger, we get sort of various parents would be giving us a lift up to the bus station. That's where we skated as little groms, and uh, yeah, just kind of just carried on after that really. So it's. I don't, you can't not be a skateboarder with Milton Keynes there really. It's, it was kind of like the perfect. I, I was going to say marble at the time, but ever since I've, I've known it's polished granite, not marble. It's a, it's a polished yeah, granite yeah. Mar uh, mecca, really, like for skateboarding. So um, it's funny, like, you know, when I first started skateboarding in the 80s, there were, you know, first time I was at the bus station was probably 1987. And there were hundreds of skateboarders then, you know, but and then down to like slowly dwindled over the years to the early 90s, where there were probably, I think at the sort of the thinnest of times, I could probably count. Yeah, I could probably count the amount of skateboarders in Milton Keynes on two hands that regularly skateboarded, probably about eight or nine of us. Um, and right. that included a couple of friends that would get the train from Lane Buzzard and come and meet us at the bus station there. And then it kind of, you know, the numbers grew again into the mid-90s and obviously, like, carried on sort of rising from there. But, yeah, I'd say probably, I don't know, like, 93, 94, maybe. At the, or maybe 92, 93, it's kind of thinnest. There are about nine of us. I mean, it's such a great capsule of British skateboarding, isn't it? The whole Milton Keynes tale and obviously you've documented that more than anyone really and the book is is you know clearly about that when, when you were a kid it's probably going to sound like a stupid question like did you kind of realize what you had did you realize like quite what a, i'm not talking about the scene so much but like you know the the actual environment that you had because it because it was so unique wasn't it and the whole story of it about how it became 
almost like appreciated by the council and the council decided to sort of yeah okay we need to like not commemorate this but we need to like acknowledge what this is culturally and we need to give it some credence like you know that's that's a brilliant part of it but did you when you were when you were a kid like we we were aware of that or were you all just skating um i think a bit of both really i think um i think we didn't really travel that much as such i mean i remember i remember when i was kind of old enough like maybe sort of 14 15 16 and you know my dad had sort of had let me go to london on my own with my mates to skate and we could hop on at milton Keynes central train station and be at euston in 40 minutes and we'd go and skate south bank and we go and skate shell center and all of those amazing spots there so we knew that there were other good skate spots out there but i think we always thought that they the grass is always greener isn't it even though we, we had great spots in milton Keynes, they were spots that we skated all the time so if we go to south bank and shell center we thought they were way better because it was a bit different and they were kind of, you know, and you'd see those in rad magazine and be like, Whoa, Curtis McCann did that over there. Or, you know, I've seen, um, I've seen a picture of Johnny Wilson or Winston Witter or someone doing that on there. And, you know, I, I want to try and do that. You know, Alex Mole did like 180 nose grind on the shell center rail. And I wanted to try and do that. Do you know what I mean? It was, I think it was because those spots were magazines, not necessarily they were better, but they were sort of skated by people that we looked up to. Do you know what I mean? So it was kind of, Yes, we had good spots in Milton Keynes, and don't get me wrong, they were good, but it was, I just think London was the most documented place in the media, maybe. So it was more of a treat to go there, perhaps. Yeah, but it's been part of like the whole thing, though, the travel, yeah. isn't it? And like yeah. exploring and, and, you know, try experience new spots. I mean, it's absolutely, especially, especially when you're a kid, isn't it? It's like, you know, you just want to go and check these places out and you want to, you want to experience it and, and also skate them as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, and skating's always been about travel for me as well. It's like the most exciting part of it. I mean, Back when I was 15, you could, you know, my dad would give me a tenner um, and that would be like enough money to buy a train ticket to London, the travel card for the day and food and drink all day as well. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah, no, just, I, I was the same. I was the yeah. same when I was a kid skating in Manchester, Fiverr, get the tram in, you know, can of Coke and a Mars bar <laughs> like, <laughs> for, for lunch. You know what I mean? And then, and yeah, that's it. Skate all day. Yeah. That, yeah. that was the day really absolutely yeah. so when i mean the other amazing thing about milton Keynes, obviously is is like from the start you must have had just constant good skaters coming through because it because even early on it had you know it was it was it was a stop wasn't it because of the uniqueness of the bus station mm, absolutely. So were you, we, sorry were, yeah were you were you like yeah is that is that what you were seeing again from that early early time I mean, people would, you know, people like professional skaters, like pros would come to skate Milton Keynes, like um, Death Box Skateboards was based in Brackley. So not too far away from Milton Keynes um, at the time in the 80s and early 90s. So Jeremy Fox would come over um, sort of now and again. And he had his eye on, a, there was a local uh, guy called, his nickname was Doc. Uh, his real name was Matthew Lindsay, but um, he wore his glasses. So everyone called him Doc. Oh, but he, he, was a, he used to be in the max, didn't he? he used yeah, to so in, he in, well, in, so his his first picture in a magazine was on a death box board that Jeremy Fox had given him. And, and because Jeremy Fox had come down and given him this board, we all thought, Doc sponsored by Death Box, he's gonna be famous. <laughs> and uh, and Wig, um, I think that was one of Wig's or maybe Wig's first photo in Rad was a picture of Doc skating one of the black square bars at the bus station. Um, so that I mean, that was. You know that was amazing to have someone like Jeremy Fox come down. But my, one of my first sort of memories of of um, a professional skater coming to Milton Keynes was Alex Mole, and then we got these little. I'm not even going to call them hubber ledges, but they were these little curb high hubber ledges that we call the concrete jibs. And I remember um, we would just about be able to front side 50 50 them. And Alex Mole came down, and we were kind of skating them one day, or rolling down the hill actually past them. We were like, oh, there's someone skating the jibs, and we went there, and it was there he was, Alex Mole, nose blunt slide, 360 shove it, like it was nothing. We were just right. like, okay, looks like we've got some catching up to do. <laughs> um, well, that, that's, <clears throat> that's what I was going to say, because that must have been amazing for the progression, because obviously when you mm. skate your little scene, you, you're all trying your best and you're all like, you know, w watching the vids and reading the mags, whatever it is back then, try to progress, try to improve. But then, yeah, someone will, I mean, you, you'd see it in Manchester where I grew up a fair amount. I mean, I used to skate, we used to skate in Stratford and Sale, basically, like at the the, the precincts and you know like just little scratchy little spots but yeah occasionally someone good would come through and you'd be like fucking hell all right but yeah. like there it must have been constant because yeah. so we, which which must have been brilliant for like the progression because constant raising of the bar 
I, I think I think when I was growing up, it wasn't constant. I mean, there wasn't. I guess you, we didn't really have American pros visiting like there was street skating, especially in the eighties. It was more about vert then, wasn't it? Um, but start as he started to get into the nineties, like I say, like you had Alex Moore, you had Tom Penny would come and skate sometimes. Andy Scott, um, even though he's a vert skater, he, he was he was good on street when he was a kid as well. I remember him doing frontside late shove it's off the the original marble blocks at the bus station, like really late. It'd be like, we couldn't work out what it was. It's like, hold on, he's ollieing. Hold on, his boards shove it around. What's, what trick's that? You know, and you're kind of introduced, <laughs> you, you know, you wouldn't see videos that often, obviously you had the old PAL videos and, you know, the H Street videos and maybe like the early, um, um, what's it, useless wooden toys, New, De- New Deal videos, New Deal. you know. Yeah. So you'd see those, but obviously they'd come out every, what, two years or something like that? So yeah, new tricks like one, few and far one... between one copy in town that everyone's borrowed and yeah yeah not exactly but, like you could revise or anything yeah but the, i think hocus pocus actually the h street hocus pocus was the one i probably watched the most because that was um i got a really decent copy of that i think one summer i probably watched it every single day before going skating so i can still probably recite to you all of the um yeah all of the tunes that were kind of made specifically for the video and kind of everything that everyone says as well <laughs> so it's in yeah there. I watched it recently. It's on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, it's great now that you can kind of access all this stuff, isn't it? So what about photography? Like when, when did you start shooting? Was that, was that hand in hand? Kind of. With, yeah. With, I had with a, your, with your interest in skating. Yeah. I had a, I had a camera when I was about seven or eight before I started skating, but I didn't really, you know, I got one for a birthday and sort of used it a little bit, but didn't really take to it. But I had just, um, when I was maybe 13 years old, I had a just a point and shoot camera and uh, none of my friends had any cameras. So one day we were kind of like, well, you know, we, we the, 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 you'd see the mags and you'd be like, oh, what would be like, what do you reckon we look like in pictures? Well, I said, oh, I've got a camera at home, so I'll bring it out. We'll buy a film together. You know, what was a roll of Kodak gold back then was probably, I don't know, like five or six quid, was it? So we'd sort of club together, buy the roll of film. It's 24 exposures. There are four of us in our crew. So, you know, that's six pictures each. So, I mean, six pictures that that, that we would have of us because that was what mattered, the pictures of you. So you get anyone else would take it. And then we'd take it to one hour processing in, in the Milton Keynes Shopping Centre and sit outside Boots for an hour. And then you get these amazing pictures of yourself back again, you know, and you could see, whoa, is that what I look like skating? You know, because we didn't have any videos of us or anything then. And there was no way of making videos. Well, we did make some bit when we were older. But, but yeah, like our first kind of memories of, images of us were were these pictures shot on my point and shoot camera um which has always kind of fascinated me because you know i was always fascinated by pictures in magazines especially skate magazines and how colorful they were and you know a lot of the time even the pic some of the pictures in early rad magazines that weren't in london were kind of ones that tim Layton boyce would have got from american photographers and you know they usually have an american on the cover until a bit later and it might be like i don't know like john montessi or like Mark Gonzalez or whoever, and they'd be like these beautiful blue skies and, you know, they'd always be like these amazing colours and be like, well, I want to do that, you know, like, and that that was kind of always inspired me to maybe, maybe it's a bit narcissistic at first, but I want, you know, I want to see pictures of me, you know, not in magazines, (laughs) but at least, at least pictures of me like skating so I can see what I look like. Do you know what I mean? And then it got to the point where I realised perhaps didn't look so great in pictures, but I liked taking them and I, I wanted to make, you know, take pictures of other people that did look good in pictures, if, you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And did you did you start sending stuff in quite early? 1991 was the first time that I sent pictures to Rad. And uh, they did a four page article or oh, five page article on, um, on Milton Keynes. And uh, I remember right. it was called Tim. I mean, I just sent a bunch of pictures to Tim and I said, because I'd met him at a competition and sort of spoken to him. I was kind of like, whoa, this is the guy from Rad. And uh, sort of said, do you mind if I sent some pictures in? So he said, yeah, go for it. And I sent them in and uh, and he, yeah, he called the article My Kind of Town because I hadn't written anything to go with it. I just sort of said, these are my mates and this is my mate ollieing over a wall or this is my mate kind of grinding a handrail. And yeah, he just turned it into an article. So we were, you know, as you can imagine, us in the Milton Keynes scene were like, oh my God, we're in the UK skate magazine. It was, yeah, it was incredible for the time. I mean, he was brilliant for that, wasn't he? like the kind of generosity of it the the democracy of it the fact that it was like because when i spoke to him for this a few years back you know he always he, i said what's your favorite cover and he's like oh it was when i went up to like some random little town and there was like a lad who had a little 
you know, the ramp in the, you know what I mean? It was like, it wasn't like, oh, it was such a pro. Like it was all about the experience. It was all about like the, the scenes that he could, that he could sort of document. And he blew my mind actually. Cause, cause I was like, oh yeah, I used to really want to send stuff in to try and write for Rad. And he was like, you should have, I would have published it. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> Fuck. I, yeah. Didn't even think I, of that really at the time. But, but, but I think, I think that's it. It's not, it's not something that we, it wasn't that we, I guess we, you know, we wanted to be famous, we wanted to be in a magazine. It was just the fact that like, obviously most of the time, cause Tim lived in London, that was the scene that got documented, which is, you know, completely fair enough. But, but we knew from traveling around to other cities that there were these other scenes out there. And that was, was quite funny. Actually, Rad used to do a two page feature in every issue called out there. And it was the only two pages most of the time that were, that were, that were of another scene from another part of the UK. So, um, so yeah, I think that was one of the reasons we sent pictures in. It was like, well, we've got a great scene in Milton Keynes here and it's only an hour away from London. And, you know, Tim sort of never comes here. Um, so we're going to send him the pictures. And that was kind of, I think that was one of the thick, one of the sort of, it kind of maybe didn't, wasn't the spark, wasn't it the, at the, at the, yeah, straight away, but it was, that was kind of one of the things that when we started Sidewalk and when we kind of took over Rad, that we wanted to kind of show as much of the of the country as possible if you see what i mean because it's you know skating i mean especially now is everywhere but even then it was everywhere but it wasn't it wasn't as cohesive as it is now because of the internet i suppose and people didn't travel as much or at least in my mind they didn't but maybe they maybe they did i don't know maybe you kind of you just need to speak to um have you have you interviewed jimmy boys before no but he comes up so much yeah you like, need, and you, I'm, you, I'm, I'm, yeah you need no and I'm, I'm, one of the trips i'm going to do is up to the northeast because I've got quite a few mates up there, and there's there's definitely loads of stuff to do up there. But everyone's always like, you got to speak to Jimmy Boys. Yeah, like he's absolutely. he's one of those like great lost names for this. That everyone's always like, you got to get him on. You need a series for Jimmy. You need like five episodes or something. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. I hear everyone's like, yeah, it's like no. I think you're right though. And sidewalk. I mean, I that's really clear. You know that that kind of let's let's cover everything let's give let's treat every scene and and i think what you're saying is totally true it's not like it was intentionally like london focused it was just more a product of that period in british skateboarding mm -hmm. wasn't it really you know they're all Absolutely. based down there that's where it kind of was you know happening obviously there were incredible skaters in other parts of the country you know like you've mentioned and liverpool kicking off great skaters in manchester like but that did take a little while to sort of feed its way out into the media of the time didn't it really mm -hmm. but so then, when did but then you... so i was going to Go say on. but then you, the, the, you say the media of the time you had rad but then you had obviously skateboard magazine that kind of started in the late 80s and went into the early 90s and that was more like non-london centric because steve kane who ran it was you know obviously ran it from bristol so you obviously had i don't know if you remember skateboard but you had like yeah had yeah this, i do you had, yeah you had the test team so they obviously had shiner distribution was always in bristol so they would, China would give the skateboard test team, which was Specs. Um, who was it? Wee Joe, maybe? Or was he? No, was he in? I might be the wrong end of the country there. He might have been in there. He might have been in uh, Edinburgh. But, that, but anyway, they had, I remember Specs, and he was incredible because he used to tear Dean Lane a new one, like on the daily. And his son, Bear Miles, actually skates now. I don't know if you know him, but he's, he's incredible. Right. But, um, um, but yeah, I mean, so that was, that was great because you'd buy Rad, and that was London centric. And you buy skateboard and both of these magazines I subscribe to and I'd get them in my local shop and go down once a month and get them. Um, but skateboard was Bristol and it used to have more of the northern cities in it. So you would see Liverpool in there regularly. She had Meany. I think Meany yeah. was a photographer who lived up in the northwest. Meany lives down there now. Oh, does he? Ian, Ian Lawton, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. He, he, he actually lives about a mile from my house. I just no saw recently. Yeah, he's like... He's got a show on a local radio station down there. If he, by any random chance, has listened to this, he's probably going to think I'm stalking him. But I just <laughs> noticed it the other day, like, because, you know, like Instagram occasionally just throws up these things, obviously, because of things that you've searched and you've liked. And so he's been popping up for me. And I was like, wow, he lives he lives near me. That's so funny. Because, yeah. And and then there was Kevin Banks, right? Who yeah, was that, who was the, also, Liverpool. like, basically documented the whole of that Liverpool scene when Rowley mm -hmm. was a, a nipper, didn't he? Yeah. As well. And that was, yeah. You, and as you say, that was all, that was all in skateboard, basically, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that, that kind of, um, yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And yeah, you had, you're right. Uh, you I, had skate action as well, which was the other one. And I didn't run for as long. I don't know if you're aware of that one, but that wasn't. I never the saw same it. quality as like yeah. radical skateboard, but it, you know, it had some good photography in it. So, 
yeah i mean we had split skates obviously which was a bit of a bit of a main line bit of a mm. you know so you could you could get stuff you could you could get the mags you could you know when new boards came in or whatever like you, you could keep up with it to a certain mm. degree but yeah i didn't never saw skate action it was that was maybe i mean i went to split not long before it closed in like 93 when i first started uni because i start i went to uni in um not in manchester but in crew crew and alsager campus was part of manchester met but it was only like an hour on the train so i'd go and skate in manchester sometimes i remember going to split yeah 93 so not long i don't think it lasted much longer than that did it maybe i mean you've no, no i don't me, think but... i don't i don't think so i think it's like a tesco metro now yeah which it is, is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is yeah such a crying shame really but that so it goes so just to take it back a little bit before you know you mentioned that you ended up on this sort of essentially like the founding staff of sidewalk really so that gap between what you're talking about the uh like putting stuff into rad and and then so what what was going on there was this you just sending more stuff in you know you mentioned am i right in thinking you made some film scene films as well it was like a milton Keynes film at some point wasn't yeah, it? yeah I, I, I made i made um read some a couple of really bad ones they were more of like a university project than than um than a proper uh, film but um a guy called lindsay knight who was involved in the mk skate project he kind of made sort of the the more sort of seminal kind of like milton Keynes scene videos because he you know he had a he had a sort of a more proper video camera and he kind of he took his editing a bit more seriously um my friend james friends james jessup and lee crow from Leighton buzzard they made a kind of scene video um my, my scene videos were literally made on um, a VHS handy cam that my dad hired from Curry's for the, like the weekend. Classic. And uh, I had no way of editing <laughs> them. So, they're, so they're, they still exist somewhere, but they're literally kind of like 50 minutes of footage until the battery ran out each day. And it's not, no, not, not edited at all. It's just on a tape and that's it. Um, yeah, I've got them somewhere. Those are, the, those are the experiments are brilliant though, aren't they? Yeah. Because everyone did them. You know, there was always somebody that had a cam, a video camera. Like the dad had one. And they, yeah. These back then they were like these fucking massive things, weren't they? On your shoulder, and you're trying to roll along on your skateboard, thinking if I hit a stone, <laughs> this is like five grand's tiny... worth of video camera down the drain. Like on your tiny wheels, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And but then, but that's yeah. I mean, I, I love all that. I we we made a film called Skaters Without a Hope when I was like forty, <laughs> 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 which is all us basically doing shit airs off our little fly off ramp that we made you know it's, it's classic all that stuff isn't it mm. so so did you i'm not going to say did you start thinking that you could make a living out of it because i'm sure the answer is no but did at that point but but you you were sending more stuff in getting into it shooting more and how, so how did it how did this like kind of it becoming a more of a job when did that start to happen um so Okay, so I'm trying to think of the back of the timeline. So I moved in with uh, Kirsty, my girlfriend, uh, in Manchester in 1997. And I was doing, I was working as, as an assistant, as, um, a photography assistant at some studios near where we lived in Worsley, um, in North Manchester. Um, and then I got poached to work as a, an assistant for um, a commercial photographer called Tracy Gibbs, and she worked on. You might know it actually. It's, if, you, if you go down the East Lanks Road towards town from North Manchester, you go past Salford Uni, you take a right there, and you've got that big Sainsbury's. I don't know if you know it. It's yeah, yeah. On Regent Road, her studio is literally, I mean, it's not advertised, but her studio is kind of just opposite that Sainsbury's. So I worked there for about a year. Um, and as I was working there, I was kind of shooting more and more skating. And it was kind of you know, when the first mobile phones were around, so I could kind of like be in work and be like doing a lighting for her and surreptitiously kind of texting people to meet them up after work. And I don't think she liked that because I was kind of moonlighting. Um, so I kind of got let go from there after about a year. Um, and I started working at a place called A4 Distribution. Don't you remember that? Yeah, they yeah. used to do yeah. Soul Technology. So I've literally... Yeah, I know Alan Darren. Yeah. There you go. So I worked in the warehouse, um, shipping out shoes and shooting skating up until the point where I was doing it that much and having that many pictures in the mag that Jim Pesky offered me a job um but just you know say but just i mean it was amazing it was like 800 quid a month which at the time in like 1999 was fucking amazing like brilliant um to to be staff for sidewalk mm -hmm. so yeah i was i just had to pinch myself every day that that was actually my job to, sh to shoot skateboarding <laughs> yeah um, a good old gym yeah I, I've, amazing yeah I so that was that 99 I've apologized, that was. I've apologized to jim recently for uh... what for <laughs> 
<laughs> just for what dicks we were back in the day. We were all dicks. <laughs> we were all dicks, and I think he knew that. I think he had. I think he had a good. Uh, I don't know. He had a good crew of dicks, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, like <laughs> totally. I mean, fucking hell. When you think back to that place, like, and that and that poor dog. <laughs> Bruno. Bruno was more like a human than a dog. No, he was a legend. But no, Jim. Yeah. Now I look back as a sort of grown up. You know, I'm a bit like, what a legend. I mean, Jim basically yeah. kind of underpinned the whole scene for like years really uh, i remember having this really boozy chat with horsley about it when we were both like quite a few years later when i think i think it was when jim had kind of sold i mean kind of sold it to factory didn't he i don't know the details but that's essentially what happened isn't it and you know we were both a bit like yeah fuck you know what what a legend like he basically <laughs> he sort of bankrolled not bankrolled it because i'm sure he made money but you know he kind of mm. supported it all didn't he yeah for, he for a while like for 15 years, really, you know, he certainly earned the right to uh, cash that in. I think it was it, it, it was a, just basically a big youth club for all of us that basically uh, he, he put his house against our wages. I know that's why <laughs> we owe a lot to that I, man. That's why I cringe <laughs> when I when I think back. And uh, but yeah, no, no, that's so that it's a, and it's such a common story, like in in our little scene, isn't it? You know that that kind of that's. So that, that, you know, they must have been the good years then, you know, obviously it's all been good, but you know, that sort of period then staff getting to do what you want. And you mentioned the travel, you know, you mentioned the cat, you know, I've always got the impression f- from looking at your work from the outside that the camaraderie, the travel, the document, the scene is as important as the document, the actual skateboarding, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons, like I said before, it's one of the reasons that I enjoy doing it. I mean, I enjoyed, you know, obviously I enjoyed shooting pictures of, of like really good, you know, maybe famous, if you want to use that word skateboarders, but, but what I enjoyed more was going to like, you know, I enjoyed more was going to a town that probably hadn't had, hadn't even been in a magazine or even been on people's like radar before, you know, and shooting, shooting a scene report of, of somewhere that just hadn't had any coverage. And it was like, you know, you'd go there and kids would be like, Whoa, okay. Geez. Like the, you know, the guy from sidewalks here, you know, we're going to, we're going to try and do our best stuff, which is obviously great for me. Whereas like sometimes say like, you know, cause I lived in Manchester and, you know, I'd go out and shoot, you'd end, you'd end up shooting a lot of the same people a lot of the time because they were the best skaters in Manchester, but because there's through no fault of their own, they might have, you know, they've just, they've got the media guy there most of the time. They don't maybe try the hardest all of the time because you just think, well, I don't have to because I'm not feeling great today and I'm going to try it next week. Whereas like, you know, if you go to do a scene report and you might only be in that town for like one or two days, like all the local guys are going to be like, right, we're going to try and do our best stuff now because it might be the only chance we get. Do you know what I mean? So it's actually sometimes it was sort of better to do that kind of thing because you knew if you travelled quite a long way to do something, you were going to get a good grip of photos, if you know what I mean. Well, it's a real art to that as well, like to actually just turn up at a place and, you know, do it in a way that's not going to intimidate people and feel weird for them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's bad, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the time, I didn't really have to do much. You know, it was kind of, it wasn't like, right, I'm here, go and jump down the biggest set of stairs. Because, I mean, I guess back in the kind of late nineties and two thousands, when skateboarding was kind of more about like like the gnarlier stuff, like the gnarlier it was, the better it was almost. Yeah. Um, kids would kind of be thinking about doing that anyway. It'd be like, you'd go to like, I don't know, some town in the kind of out in the wilderness in northwest England and. The local guy who was really good would be like, I've been thinking about trying that 16 set all my life. <laughs> and you're here and I'm going to try it. And sometimes yeah. he would land it and sometimes he wouldn't. But, you know, it was, it's, you know, it's obviously not that, but kind of similar to that, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. Well, yeah. when I when I was chatting to Wig about doing this, one of the things that he said, I mean, it really made me realize that good skate photography makes it look quite easy, I think, you know, like, but there's so many elements that go into it to actually give you that impression of that, you know, this trick happened in a certain way. There's a lot going on. There's a lot more going on than you kind of first appreciate. I think, you know, like to, to actually, to actually kind of consistently bang out high quality skate photography is, is an art like anything else. And and it, it's, it's not just something, especially, you know, the point I'm sort of getting to, like working with people that might not be familiar with it, which is a big part of it, presumably for you, right? I think so. I think, um, I mean, yeah, obviously there's that like excitement of meeting new people and excitement of getting to skate new spots myself. Um, 
and maybe kind of spots that someone's sent you a picture of and you think holy shit where is that oh it's up in the highlands of scotland underneath the motorway bridge you know you've got to drive four hours to get there or maybe nine hours to get there or wherever but it's kind of like i'm going you know what i mean because one it's going to make a great photo and two i get to scale it myself but just going back to what you were saying about kind of you know consistently taking good skate photos we i mean a lot of it was kind of trial and error and a lot of it to be fair talking about wig he's kind of like the i always refer to him as the grandfather of british skate photography because a lot of the way that we like most of us shot back then kind of was filtered down from from him because he you know i was lucky enough to kind of grow up down the like three miles down the road from him he lived in stony stratford in milton Keynes, and i lived in a little village called pottersbury and i used to see him all the time and he'd be like and hushed tones oh my god there's wig <laughs> you know, yeah it was kind of almost like that really but like he was a person that showed me how to print in the dark room he was the person that was kind of like maybe you want to get a better lens and a better camera than the one you've got there you know go out and get a second hand canon c90 and you know maybe don't use that 17 millimeter lens that kind of stretches everything in the corners maybe you want to get a fisheye lens you know again all this stuff wasn't cheap but you kind of you sort of saved up for it and you know found a someone who was selling their old one and got it, you know, got them to give it you cheaper and begged and borrowed and stole until you had the equipment. Um, and we figured out, I mean, well, he figured out and kind of passed it on to us how to use flash and kind of what flash duration was and like what power you had to put your flash on, how far away you had to put it using a flash meter. I never even knew what one of those was until he told me, what, you know, and, and, and to get the right exposure, you know, it's kind of, you make the mistakes. You know, shooting on film, obviously you can, didn't have any previews, so you were just kind of shooting blind a lot of the time. But from making the mistakes and kind of doing it and have, okay, I've got a hundred speed film, I've got my Mets on quarter power. It was way too close in that last one and it burnt everything out. So I'll put it further back and I'll use a flash meter and I'll get F5.6. And you do that over and over, you do it every day. And after a while you get to know the film that you're shooting, you get to know your equipment. And I think, I think that that's kind of what I'm getting at is like just doing it a lot doing it in certain lighting conditions and knowing how to do stuff just from just from doing it all the time that's that's what it was yeah and then and then you know you accrue enough experience and suddenly if you're lucky you might have a job or you <laughs> might or, or, or not even a job but you might you, you know you, your passion might lead you somewhere interesting let's just think, put it in those in those I, terms I, even. yeah I, I, I think with anything like that it's kind of you, the passion passion is the key for it you know if you you might love photography but you equally have to love your subject matter as well and that's what i always kind of say if i'm doing them um, if i'm doing a kind of a lecture about photography i'll say you know what are you interested in other than photography because people say i like taking pictures of stuff but like i don't know what to take pictures of it's like well what else do you like like join your two passions together for me luckily for me like skateboarding came first then photography came after but for people that like pick up a camera and say i like photography they've it's almost they're at a disadvantage because they've got to find something they want to take pictures of afterwards yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, that's also like a good rule for creativity generally, that isn't it? You know, you because it's like when because I'm a, a writer and like a journalist, and it's the same thing with that. You know, people can be like, well, what should I write about? You know, and it's like anything, it's just you just have to do it a lot, don't you? Yeah. You, you know, repetition, work it out, work out what's good for you. And then the other important thing about that is you also kind of start developing a, a style and your own language and, and you can start to, as you just described, I mean, that was really interesting hearing you describe all that process and all the influence of wig. Cause you know, those are the, the, the building blocks of your own style, aren't they? You know, taking those influences and then doing your own thing with them. I mean, it's fairly like almost like a glib thing to say, but that is kind of how it happens, isn't it? You know, that's yeah. how you, that's the process that leads you there really. I think, um, I mean, you know, you, you are, you, I mean, I was influenced by wig a lot, but you know, you're influenced by the photography that you see in other skateboard magazines, you know, kind of, you've got like trans world skateboarding, obviously and thrasher of kind of like the late nineties, like up to mid two thousands. And, you know, in the late nineties, street skating was kind of, you know, you had a lot of street skating and it, it just got like gnarlier and more tech as you went into the two thousands. Like if you look at kind of like 2000 and one or 2002 trans worlds it was like it was like the flip guys you know yanato like front side board slide in el toro a 20 stair handrail like in the stuff that had never been done before like kind of you know you like you're, and you're seeing these amazing pictures of it and you're like wow okay you know i, I want to find the guy that can like slide a big handrail in the uk and try and emulate that you know but it's not just about kind of the skateboarding itself it's like 
I'm looking at it going, how, how does he light that? Because that's such a big area to light. He's going to need, <laughs> you know, he's going to need probably about 10 flashes to do it. And that was when we kind of started shooting with, or, or like, again, we could add one of these flashes called a Lumidine, which was like much like more powerful than the speed lights that we used to use. It used to get knocked over and smashed and the batteries would fall out and stuff all the time. But these Lumidines had their own power pack with them. So they were like a studio flash on the street. And that was when you could kind of start shooting with like medium format cameras because, you know, the bigger the format, the more light you need for it. So, and obviously the bigger the spot, the more light you need for it. So it was like, okay, you had to expand our kit again and learn how to use new cameras and different kinds of film and different lighting to be able to kind of keep up with the way that photography was changing as it were. And again, that was all, you know, that did sort of come from wig, but it came from sort of all of us kind of doing it together. I remember a time that we, um, myself, uh, wig and a guy called Oliver Barton. Don't know if you're aware yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we so we another, met up in another, Birmingham. Another person whose name comes up a lot as a possible guest. Yeah. Yeah, you should definitely do Ollie. I mean, he's he's been everywhere and done everything pretty much. But he um, we, yeah, so we all met up in Birmingham, underneath the motorway flyover, as is often the case. A place called Fastlands, which is like a spot in the centre of Birmingham. And a young James Woodley, actually, who we've got um, actually in the mag that comes out in two days, he's got an interview in there. He's sort of come back around again. But we just got him to ollie into this bank about 20 times um, and we were experimenting with the Hasselblad fisheye and the focus on it because it didn't focus like a 35 millimeter fisheye it was like we kept getting photos that were out of focus and we and it didn't make any sense with the kind of the meters and feet on the lens didn't really correspond with how far away the subject was from the lens and if, if they're up in the corner of the fisheye they're actually further away than they seem and yada 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 but anyway we shot these pictures of james took them to the lab sat there kind of looking through the loop on the light box and then figured out actually this is the sweet spot for the focus for the lens and then all our pictures after that because we kind of come together and had a meeting of the minds we figured out okay this is how we need to use this lens and uh and yeah and it was again it was kind of photography improved because of that if you see what i mean yeah that's great i mean how brilliant is that like you know collaborating at that level rather than not being dicks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, though, because like, because, because, I mean, that's that's skating, that surfing, snowboarding, like all these worlds, like that that camaraderie, that community is is part of it. Again, an obvious thing to say, but that that is great. I don't know how common. I don't, I'm not sure if that's the case in in you know the fashion arena. Let's just say. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. And, and and the thing is, it's kind of that's one of the things about skating for me is um, I don't know. I love I love. I mean, what we're doing with skateboarders companion at the moment. I love kind of how many different skate photographers there are now. I mean, I don't know if they all call themselves skate photographers as such, but how many people there are, you know, that are like documenting their scene or taking photos of their friends skating and they're sending pictures into us. I've got, you know, I've got a contributors folder on my hard drive and I've probably got about 40 different folders in there from various different people that might've sent one photo or they might've sent 40 photos, do you know what I mean? But like, and some of them, some of the photos are good enough to go in print, some of them aren't, but that doesn't mean they might not be good enough to go in one of our online galleries. And it's just about kind of like, it's, it is about nurturing photographic talent, but it's also about trying to show as much of the UK and Irish scene as possible through people that actually live in the scenes rather than the guy that has to travel to get there, if you see what I mean. So that's one of the things we really wanted to do. I mean, I guess it's a different part of the interview now, but like with the Skateboarders Companion was actually try to like, it's, it, it's a bit, yes, it's about kind of like who's good in the UK and Irish scene, but it's also about the scenes themselves, if you see what I mean. Yeah, well, like that you know, that, people kind of slag off it's quite fashionable these days to sort of slag off instagram and and social media and say it's devalued the art of photography because you know you should look at pictures on print like in the printed form and i do i do understand that and i do have a certain amount of sympathy for that as a bit of an old fart that grew up with print but at the same time you cannot argue with how democratic it is now and like the fact that if you've got talent now you, you can make your own little platform and, and get yourself attention and that that especially in skateboarding and i think that's got to be a good thing doesn't it like personally yeah, absolutely you know so yeah so skateboarders companion uh i mean i i just love that when i saw it because i was a bit like what a fucking retro slash insane but totally brilliant move in 2020 to like start a print uk print skate mag like you know, and I'm sure again you've kind of heard heard that before because it's like 
you you probably wouldn't say it's the most promising environment to do it in but you kind of did it anyway and it's it's brilliant so where where did it come from like did you was it just literally like let's make a mag we should do it yeah i mean myself and ryan gray who i don't know if you know ryan he was the um sort of the assistant editor at sidewalk i don't know ryan okay so he was the assistant editor at sidewalk for I try, I try to think when I first kind of met him, maybe 2008 or nine. So he was like the assistant editor for like all the journalists, then assistant editor for, for like the last sort of 10 years of the mag up until 2018 when it finally went. But when it went in 2018, like, you know, cause it, it was online from 2015, you know, straight away I sort of said to Ray, you know, we, we need to start another, another mag like sidewalk. Um, but we, we just didn't have the means to do it. You know, we were like, we talked about it for years, but we didn't have the money to, to front the first issue of a print mag because you know you can get you, know, you can go out and get the advertisers but you're not going to get the money until after the first mag has been printed so you it's, it's, it's a catch-22 so we'd always talked about it and we even kind of like you know had a couple of meetings at the pub and like made lists and you know had a few beers and we're like yeah we'll do it one day we'll do it one day we'll, we'll get the money like one of us will win a lottery or you know one of our nans will die or <laughs> we'll get some inheritance or something <laughs> but um but it never happened up until the point where, you know, we're sat in the backyard in the house here um, this time last year, um, the first lockdown, beautiful weather, chatting away. Um, and I'd, one of the things, I don't know I, if you want me to talk about on here is, I mean, I, I've, I've been shooting a few weddings the last few years. Um, talk about what you want, man. It's okay. All, it's and, all open. And it's, um, yeah, it's so, so one, so one of the, one of the things about shooting weddings is obviously it's a completely different arena to skating. But it's funny that the people that you meet doing it, because actually a guy called Matt Law, who I don't know if you know Matt, but he has distributed Desira Shoes for a long time. And he's had kind of various distribution companies doing other brands as well. But the one sort of constant has been Desiris. Um, I was kind of scrolling through Instagram, looking at other wedding photographers, and I seen this Matt Law creating diamonds. And I'm like, I know a guy called Matt Law. It can't be him. He's not a wedding photographer. And then I kind of figured out actually it was the same guy. And I sort of gave him a shout and spoke to him for years. And ended up, anyway, ended up doing a few weddings with him. Fast forward to the first lockdown and uh, I'm chatting to him on the phone about weddings. And he says, um, have you ever thought about starting a starting a skate mag again? Because, you know, we're kind of not doing anything and just I'm sat here kind of selling skateboards to people. And uh, I was like, just hold on a sec there. So I put the phone down, ring up Ryan. I'm like, we might have a third party here for our magazine. And, uh, you know, Ryan says, we'll call him back. And I introduced those guys. And yeah, that was literally this time last year, April, 2020. And, uh, fast forward a year and we've managed to do one issue already and issue two is coming out in two days. So, so, right. So it was a classic, the classic lockdown project. Brilliant. Yep. If lockdown hadn't happened, we wouldn't have a magazine, but there you go. So it's, um, you know, we talked about it. I mean, you know, me and Ryan, lots of ideas for it. And we talked about it for a long time. So I guess kind of that part of it was already in motion as it were, but just actually the ins and outs of going to see advertisers and, you know, seeing people that we know in the industry and sort of, Kind of making them believe that we could actually do another print mag that is available in news agents again or is that is that model too antiquated to work and i think we've already sort of proved with the first issue that it isn't and that yeah. there is another generation of kids especially girls that are starting now kind of like you know 10 11 12 years old that something like the skateboarders companion is still relevant and like you know is kind of is needed in this kind of modern day as well yeah i completely agree and you must have you must have been really gratified by the response because obviously it was like embraced pretty quickly by the scene and um, has sold out, been a success. And, you know, it looks like the next one is also probably going to fly out really, isn't it? Fingers I mean, it must crossed. Be, must be great be, being back in that game again, like being able to sort of do that again. You must be it, I mean, it, it, it is, it's cool, but um, sometimes you think, you know, I've bitten off more than I can chew because, I mean, I didn't have any weddings to shoot last year. I mean, well, I think I did about three or four that were like six people or something. But all of the ones from last year have moved to this summer. And once they start cranking again, come 17th of May and 21st of June, I'm doing that. I'm shooting photos for the mag. I'm sitting at my desk selling skateboards in the week. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is it's going to go nuts this year. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm joking, really. It's, it's a good problem to have. It's good to be busy. But... um but yeah, like I'm, I'm stoked on doing the mag and just, just to be honest, stoked on not having to do 
a lot of it myself because there's a load of other amazing skate photographers out there that are, that are helping us out. You know, there's a guy we've got working on our stuff called uh, Robert Whiston, and he's a guy from Birmingham. Um, he's got four kids and he's a grafter. He, he works as a builder, but somehow has loads of time to go out and take skate photos as well. I think it must be because he's not even thirty yet, so he's still got lots of energy. <laughs> yeah, he still, we'll soon beat that out of him, though, eh? He still doesn't need sleep. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, change. I mean, and 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 but but that's but that's again, it's like in all seriousness, it's one of the reasons for doing it. It's not just to to like talk about like how many amazing like new skateboarders are out there, but just about how many people are shooting great skate photos and how many people are making great skate videos and just. Yeah, just like the scene. Then the scene encompasses everybody, doesn't it? Like skateboarders and people that document skateboarding. Yeah, you can really see that from the way you put it together. You know, like there's there's a focus on like geography, isn't there? You know, like in places and, and which obviously Sidewalk always had as well. But you can see the thought that's gone into like what you're talking about and how you're talking about it. I'm interested in the name. The, na- the name struck me as like considered. So what was going on there? So we, oh blimey, when we started thinking about a name, come, it probably took us nearly a year to get the, to get the name hammered out, to be honest. We had, um, you know, when you're kind of trying to think of a name for your first offspring and you've got a book of names and you're kind of like going through it for months and months and months. I don't know if, do you, do you have kids yourself? No, but we had the same thing when we uh, got our dog, so I can ah, slightly empathise. There you go. I mean, it's, it's similar to that. I mean, there's never going to be the right name, is there? And we, you know, we kind of, agonized over it for months but we but we wanted a name that wasn't you know like a lot of the current skate mags are kind of their one word um because that works i guess for social media and it's easy to remember yeah. free skate mag, yeah. gray skate mag vague skate mag. vague yeah 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 which nothing wrong with that but we wanted something that was the opposite of that that was kind of that you know that the people are definitely going to get wrong you know people say are you that guy from the skateboard companion or are you the are you the the, the skating companion guy, whatever, like people are, you know, you're setting yourself up for, for kind of comedy names to be, to be kind of made up about you with that. But, but we wanted it to be something that was a bit more, that was a bit different, but also was kind of, that harked back to, to kind of yesteryear, I suppose, a little bit, but also yeah, was that's, new. That's why yeah. I asked the question really, because it's got that kind of classic, sort of almanac quality hasn't it do you know what yeah. i mean like you know mm. sat in your armchair with your kind of nice it's, it's old school i like i liked yeah. it it's kind of gives, was, um, gives... it was it, it, it was something that right that I, I mean i've got to give credit to right it was it was one of his ideas and it was like it just seemed to just fit you know it's like something like compact like something that you want to that isn't throw away that you want to keep and you want to kind of return to and you know that's why we've got things like how to's in it i mean you know you can watch kids can go on YouTube and watch how to do an ollie in on about like 50 different channels but you know you can take it with your skate and look at it on your phone but it's better to have it you can like set the mag on the on the floor at the skate park and be like right step one what do I do okay there's Eddie Belvedere who's showing me how to do it as a real person you know he, he, he's, he's there he is at Mount Hawk doing the trick Sam Beckett how do I axle stall on a mini ramp okay you know step one drop in okay shit I've fallen off but I'm going to try again I don't know it's it's just maybe it's just me kind of being a little bit um nostalgic but i i just think that that maybe is something that's missing from uk skating or maybe i'm wrong i don't know but at least the, the media as such how, how do you mean just like things like how to's things like sheets of stickers things like posters things things that are for the kids things that are for kids that have just started skating that's for me was kind of one of the things and again i'm not I'm not saying that the other skate mags are bad because they're wicked. They all do their own like stuff in a really good way. But for me, things that have been missing for sort of the last few years since I went are stuff that's for, as Horsley puts it, little Tommy Birkins. He is yeah, like this well, mythical dude that's just started skating. He doesn't know anything about skating. And you're going, okay, here's some stickers. Here's a poster. Put it on your wall. You know, like just be stoked about skating. Like here's how to do the basic tricks, you know, and here's like a bit of history. And here's like who are the, really hot fucking amazing skaters these days and here's someone who used to be really good and it's just the whole everything do you know what i mean trying to put everything into one place yeah exactly and that tangible physical thing is important you know like a sticker for a kid ain't going out of fashion like you know does it it could be the the 23rd century and you give a kid a a sticker they're going to be stoked (laughs) they're not going to be they're not going to be like well it's not digital like they're going to be like fucking sticker you can't stick your fucking smartphone on the bottom of your skateboard and skate can you can try but 
Gonna break well, it. I, do, I, th- I think that, like uh, that's what I really like about about what you're doing though, because I think it's it's the combination, isn't it? It's like, well, let's acknowledge the reality of skating in the UK now. Like you know, you've already said, like let's let's give all these new photographers a platform. Let's give women more of a platform. Let's give girls, you know, there's so many amazing girls now. Let's make sure that they're getting the right coverage and the and the right and being talked about. Let's let's go to all these different places and, and document it like reflect the reality of modern skateboarding but equally give it a bit of an analog feel like make a magazine that's that's brilliant you know give stickers away like do do that that that's kind of nodding you know it's got a foot in both camps hasn't it it's like nodding to the heritage which is important but also like kind of the, the reality that we're in now and i think mm. that's why I, th- I thought it was brilliant because even the fact that you did it i was like wow fair enough like magazine at this point in 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 history is fucking bold and great you know it's and kind of and like you said obviously the appetite was there clearly because mm. people have been stoked on it yeah it was funny because we went to um menzies which is the mainstream distributor for magazines that just distributes into smiths and you know independent news agents mm. and uh you know we said to them we want to start this skate magazine would you stock it and they obviously had to do their analysis and they said uh right well we've got um uh we've been to smiths and they've got two other skateboard titles currently and we were, we said, oh, uh, so which are they then? They went Thrasher. I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. But I think, I can't remember how many issues of Thrasher they sell every issue in, in uh, every every time in Smith. So I think it's only like 100 or something for the whole country, right. which is nothing. And uh, and Huck magazine. And I was like, Huck magazine? Okay, no, I have seen that. Um, and it does have some skating in it, but I wouldn't call it a skateboard magazine. So we kind of, you know, we had a meeting with them. We were like, yeah, okay, Thrasher is, you know, it's legit as you get as a skate mag, but it's mostly us content you might get the odd kind of like uk skater in there and obviously what we want to do is a purely uk and irish skate mag so they kind of were like okay you know we sort of said what we used to do and you know we all used to do sidewalk and matt's been in skateboarding his whole life as a distributor and yeah we just took it from there and uh i think we of i can't remember how many i think we made ten thousand copies for the first issue um and at least half of those went into smith's and i think we yeah, I think the sell through was kind of like maybe like a fifth or a third of those copies sold, which for a first issue apparently is like unheard of. That's what the, the lady at Menzies was saying anyway. So yeah, we've uh we're pretty stoked on what on how we've done so far. That's amazing. I didn't realise you'd printed so many. That is great. Mm. That's a that I mean that's that's fucking respectable numbers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean it's 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 respect for Matt for kind of fronting the money to to print the most of the first ones. Yeah, um, and that and that's that's punchy as well. I like you know i'm i'm not sure you know to be totally honest i'm, I'm sure you had the same conversations i bet you were like fucking hell ten thousand, really we can do that you know it's like mm. quite a lot in it but fair enough like but that i mean to, but to talking about like the model of like getting the mag to to people like we obviously the other mags they're not in in um news agents but their model is to give them free to skate stores and skate stores give them away for free so yeah. we wanted because obviously we agonized about this for months we're like well we want to do one that's in news agents and obviously we need a cover price for that but we also want to give it away for free in skate stores and we thought well do we make some with a cover price on some not and actually when we were talked to menzies about it they said they said that's fine you know you can give a proportion of your magazines for, away free in skate stores like with the cover price on but we would just consider that marketing so we send a box to gee i've just done the list yesterday i think there's a hundred and f- no 108 UK stores and skate parks so far that we send a box of free magazines to of 30, 33 magazines in a box to each of those, um, which they get to give away for free. And then obviously once they're gone, then you can buy it from, from news agents. And that's hopefully that model will sort of continue to work. We'll see. So you said the, the second volume issue edition is out next week. We're recording this end of April, 2021. So people can it's out, get it's out on the 29th of April in two days. <laughs> nice I'll, put, yeah. I'll try and put this out pretty quick then so that, that um people can Thanks. actually get one because it will it will sell out won't it for sure i, yeah. hope, I hope so yeah i mean it, and it, we we've got more copies i can't remember how many we settled on this time but we've got more copies printed but you got to remember it's um you know we're using like expensive paper stock the stickers of oh man the stickers kill us because like they cost a fortune to make that like ten thousand sheets of stickers because they're made at a place in london then shipped to the printers in wales like to be on time to be like perfect bound into the mag and obviously the posters are made by the by the printers as well and 
geez, getting the getting the artwork for the poster in time is always a nightmare. Just ask Horsley about that. Because um, <laughs> he's, well, he's, he, we didn't have him as our designer of the first issue, but he designed the second issue and hopefully he's going to continue to do it. Um, but just, yeah, but just like the cost involved in getting it printed are like way beyond what we thought it was going to be. But we were just like, well, if we can get enough ads to, to make it work, then, then, you know, so be it. And we've just about broke even with, you know, we've got enough ads to do the printing. We're not making any money out of it, but that's what it is. We just wanted to make something that was, that was kind of like looked really good. was really colorful, was really high quality that kids really want to get hold of each month. And hopefully it will just kind of grow from there. We just have to see. Yeah. So bit, bit of a sort of cheesy scene question. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to comment on the Olympics. Don't worry. But <laughs> how, how, how do you feel about the kind of the, the, the health of it in the UK right now? The, health of the this skate the scenes. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's always, it's, I was, I was going to say like, most of the places that I go and, and, you know, I don't actually, I haven't been traveling that far and wide over the last few months, obviously, but, um, I did back in, I'm trying to think when it was now, when it was snowing, I did a trip up to, uh, to Manchester and Birmingham to get photos for some of the stuff that we've got an issue to now. And, um, even when it was absolutely freezing cold and, you know, like people really didn't want to be outside. I was up in Manchester and there were, there were loads of skateboarders like you know like and, and obviously all the skate parks are closed but they were just skating these undercover spaces you know out of the wind and the rain and the snow and same in Birmingham like multi-story car parks just loads of kids you know that you know they're I was at Lloyd's the other day and this is when the weather was better uh, Lloyd's in Bristol Lloyd's Amphitheatre and I probably knew about there were probably about 100 skateboarders there and I probably knew about maybe 10 or 15 of them and the rest of them were like just young kids some of them you know, got the, obviously got their first set up, they're skating in their like football trainers in the tracksuit, whatever. And they're with a bunch of their mates and you're just like, shit, this is kind of like when I started kind of a long, long time ago, you know, it is, it is, it's a boom. It's like, it's the next, I don't want to call it a craze, but there are just loads of kids that have got skateboards now. I, I, I don't know whether yeah. to call them skateboarders, but they're, but they're doing it, you know? No, it's not, it's really noticeable. It's really noticeable mm. down there as well. There's a lot of kids. Like do you know uh, do you know Pete Helica? I do know Pete. Yeah. yeah. He's in Lewis, yeah. right? Yeah, he's got this he's got the shop. I'm due to go and see him actually. Um yeah, he's he was on a he was like about my fifth episode, actually, Pete. I'm not listening to that. Oh man. Right, I need to listen to that one. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. And it was great because obviously I did it in person. We did it. He's he's got a little I don't know if he's still got it, but he had a little music studio in Lewis. So we did it there. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, no, I love Pete. Um, I actually need a new, um, like, I need to go and treat myself. New, new setup, new complete. So I'm going to go and see him and uh, try and sort that out it's soon. I think skate society. Um, yeah, no, it's brilliant. He's yeah, and uh, but again, like down here, there's just so many good young skaters at the minute. Like it's it's great. It's great to see. So I, uh, I mean, I'll start wrapping up a little bit because uh, I've had you on for a little while. But like, so the Milton Keynes, I, I, I won't mind going back to to that if that's all right because obviously sure. you did do the book yeah which is which you know it was quite recent wasn't it it was the last couple of years i'm like that you guys put that together and it is an amazing sort of capsule of that whole scene from from sort of start to finish really and you know and as i kind of alluded to earlier and obviously you don't need me to say this because you wrote a book about it but like as a cultural moment of like british skateboarding and also british youth culture generally it's it's quite a mad little capsule isn't it you know the whole thing mm. so where did the idea for the book and and there was an exhibition you know there was there was a lot going on around that so where did where did that all start like how did that come about so that was actually a so that was actually milton Keynes council um what i, I, I don't i actually don't know where the initial idea for it came from but it was it was a it was a national lottery heritage funded grant that actually enabled the whole project to happen. Okay, so it was uh, we actually had um, a woman called Caterina Luigio, and she she actually wrote the bid to the National Lottery Heritage Fund because I think she that's what she does she writes bids and and sort of oversaw the whole project. So without her, it wouldn't have happened. But um, but yeah, we got this money and um, we decided what we were that we were kind of, you know, we like, like you say, it's like a time capsule. You need, we needed to kind of go right back to the start of skating in Milton Keynes and 
you know, find the kind of main protagonists from that, like, you know, who, who were the people that were first skating at Milton Keynes, where they skateboarded, um, were there any photos from the time, was there any video from the time, were there artifacts from the time, because some of those were shown in the actual physical exhibition itself. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I started skating in Milton Keynes in probably, let's say, 1986, but then people were skating there before that, and the people I hadn't really heard of before, that were, um, like Neil, who, you know, kind of helped sort of unearth that, Lindsay Knight, who was one of my friends who I sort of grew up skating with, who kind of made the films. He knew a little bit about the history because he'd made a, a previous video of the history of skating in Milton Keynes. Uh, Rob Selly, um, kind of one of great the... Do you remember? Do you remember? Great, un, great unsung hero of British skateboarding. Exactly. So, you know, he was professional for, for blueprint skateboards for a while, you know, and I, again, I skated with him for years. Um, taught him everything he knows. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, and my, my friend James Jessup, yeah, who... Good. He, uh, he um, James Jessaby, um, I skated with him for years. He's one of the guys from Leighton Buzzard, who I mentioned, made a made a scene film. Um, but he is an amazing artist, and he studied at, did a master's at Royal College, and he does these crazy abstract paintings. And he actually did a huge one for that took up one whole wall of the exhibition, like a new painting for it. Um, I'm kind of rambling a bit here, but yeah, but just it no, was not it at was, all. It was, it was the MK skate project was. I mean, it was amazing to be involved in it. It was sort of my photos in the book, but one of my jobs was to was to kind of be like the photo creator for that and try and get photos from as many different people that had shot photos in Milton Keynes over the years as possible. You know, we wanted pictures of famous skateboarders, heavy hitters that had come through Milton Keynes and done like amazing things there. But we also wanted pictures of just, just people that have been in the Milton Keynes scene over the years, because that's obviously changed from era to era as well. So that was amazing for me too, because there was, stuff that I thought I knew about it, like and people that I definitely knew skate in Milton Keynes, but then there were times when I hadn't really been there and people that had done stuff, like, you know, good stuff that I had no idea about that weren't like someone who skated for girl skateboards or chocolate skateboards or whoever, do you know what I mean? That, that had like, that were a local guy and they were, you were like, oh, I've got this picture of such and such a guy who was a local and he ollied these stairs before anybody else and I had no idea. So it was kind of like, it was a learning experience for me and just, yeah, it was, it's just, um, it's just, I, I wish kind of, I, I, I say I wish, I think more areas of the country are doing it. I've kind of, I've heard of a similar project out in East Anglia that's been put together. I know Kat was working on something in Southampton where it was maybe similar as well. So, so yeah, it's just, I think it's almost every, every part of the country, every scene has their kind of history of skating. And it's just, it's amazing to be able to, be able to put it down in a physical thing like a book, but also to have the tangible artifacts in the exhibition like boards that have been skated in Milton Keynes like pieces of the smashed up granite block that was the original block at the bus station that got taken away before the plaza was put there and it was like what we grew up skating on like there were pieces of that there you know it's kind of you can you sort of hold it in your hands and be like that truck metal that's on the edge of the lip there <laughs> some of that is mine from when I was like 13 years old do you know what I mean like it's yeah well that's why I was kind of that's why I sort of bring it up really because like that cultural like giving skateboarding its proper cultural due basically is what's going on there isn't it you know and and i think i was reading something in slam maybe where you guys did a obviously did a thing to promo it which is brilliant and and i'm assuming like people will be familiar with a lot of the pictures you know obviously and they're all in the book you know there's like penny and there's like there's there's um Manzori, like calling over the rail, like there's, you know, there's, there's all the classic stuff and there's like all the American guys there's Cairo over the Nolly hard flip over the bar and all that stuff, loads mm -hmm. of the locals and that, but wigs, one of the things that's really interesting about it and wig talks about this in that slam thing is about like how skate stops it's been over the years as well and how it's evolved. And that, in, in, and that in, in a way is also the story of skateboarding in this country, isn't it? You know, it's like a constant sort of battle even in a place like Milton Keynes, where it was at one point accepted to the point where the council like built a plaza, but then that's been stopped as well, hasn't it? At yeah. Point. So I was like, about to say, it's funny. You know, like, so it's like this crazy evolution. Uh, and I think Wig puts it so nicely. He says something like, you know, you can't cage skateboarding. I can't, I'm paraphrasing, you know, he's mm. like, again, they've tried to sort of contain skateboarding and all it does is it gives us another reason to sort of progress. And, always, always. And that, and that's such an amazing sentiment. Well, that's kind of the reality. That's what everyone, that's what skaters know about skateboarding. Yeah. And that's what I really love about that project because that's what it basically captures. Like, yeah, it's a story of like 
it's a story of the scene. It's a story about a set of obstacles. It's a story about the people who've come through there, but it's really a story about British skateboarding, isn't it? And like yeah. how, how that has evolved in the last 30 years. And yeah, I mean, it's a great piece of work. If you're not, this is to anyone listening, still available, you should support it, you should buy it. Still copies out there. On a geeky, on a geeky tip, slight, slight skate geeky question. What's the best thing you ever saw at Milton Keynes? I knew you were going to ask that. Um, okay, what, what, <laughs> that was okay. slightly flat. That was slightly telegraph, wasn't it? Like? No, no, it's, it's all right though. I mean, it's it's it. I, I'm, I'm like I say, I said at the beginning, I'm a skate rat, and I kind of I'm a total geek, and I, you know, I still I still fan out over you know guys that are really good and have done good stuff there. But like probably one of the best things I've seen done at Milton Keynes was um, a Brian Anderson line from a girl skateboards tour in 2004. And it's on, um, it's on the, I think it was called, the tour was called All You Meets Girl, the Manchester Daily Titled. Um, it, and he, he, there's a, a spot called the Brown Bar, which is now white, <laughs> but um, at the time it was brown. And you've got the one that's a three stair in a bar, and then you've got a hill, and then you've got the one that's like an eight stair in a bar, which is kind of like the, the gnarly one. But at the, you've got the eight stair in the bar kind of this way, where you would kind of come out into the road. And then at 90 degrees to it, you've got this huge handrail that I remember um, a local guy called Dean Jasper caveman for a skateboard, uh, the original skateboard magazine article in like 1990 or something. But you can, if you're Brian Anderson, ollie out past this pillar that's in the way of it, that's in the way of the natural line to ollie over it and ollie over the rail. So he says, I'm gonna do this. Okay, and we're like, okay, so I set up my camera for it. <laughs> and then he decides, yeah, right, with the, 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 okay, you're going to do it, right, okay. Um, and then he decides he's going to do it at the end of the line. So he goes up to the, the first brown bar at the top of the hill, the small one I was talking about, and he's trying to front side nollie over that. And he does that a couple of times, and then he kind of cruises down the hill and he does a switch 360 flip going downhill, about two foot high, like he can do. And then I think he maybe does like a half cab or something, and then the plan was to ollie the rail at the end. And, of course, I'm there kind of sweating, thinking – oh Jesus, like shooting this picture of Brian Anderson, like what if he just does it first try and I, I, the flash doesn't go off or I don't I don't get the picture or whatever. And, uh, you know, he's trying the front side nollie, can't do it, can't do it, suddenly does one. Okay, um, I think Ty Evans, the, you know, fucking best bit, like skate video for the time was filming this line, does a switch tray. Okay, shit, is bombing the hill now. Does a half cab. Oh my God, he's kind of on the run up for the rail. And I'm like, I remember just looking through my camera thinking, don't fuck this up, don't fuck this up. Ollie's over the rail, makes it first time. Everyone goes nuts. I've shot the photo. I'm just like, it's on film. I've got no idea whether I got it or not. He's not going to do it again. Luckily, the photo <laughs> came out. It was just, but it was one of those things that heart was in my mouth. I was like, he did it first try. I hope I fucking got that. I mean, I, I think what, what happened, what usually happened with these American tours was there was usually an American photographer there for Transworld or for Thrasher or whatever, who you'd be like, who would be shooting as well. So you wouldn't feel so, under so much pressure because I'd be shooting at the sidewalk. There'd be another guy who'd be like, okay, you know, he's, he's probably got the photo, it's fine. But when it's just you and you're like, shoot, you're the only photographer on there and everyone looks at you like, did you, did you get the photo? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, of course. Woo, high fives all around. And inside you're like dying thinking, fuck, I hope I got it. But yeah, it's, yeah, that, I mean, that's goes, just, yeah, just, just one example of it, I suppose. The print, the print days when you couldn't actually check. Yeah. And, and, and that's, but there's, I mean, you know, I always say there's something magic about film as well. Not, maybe not when you're under so much pressure, but like there's something magic about, going to the lab, putting the film through and actually seeing your pictures on the light box rather than kind of the instant gratification or non gratification of shooting digital, you know, like, and that's the thing these days, like when you shoot a picture, everyone wants to see it straight away. So if you fuck it up, you're going to be like, Hey guys, look, it's shit, isn't it? I fucked it up. <laughs> but it's like, at least in the film days, you could be like, yeah, I've got to take it to the lab. I'll, uh, I'll show it you next week. And you could like scan it in and like maybe do Photoshop to it and make it look a bit better than it was before. But, um, but these days you're, you know, the proof is in the pudding and the pudding is right there straight away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm.